Well, this is so interesting, Brina. I feel like I could go all day asking you a thousand questions. So what do you, do you diversify? Like, let's say that you're doing uh, a horse race. Do you bet on three of the eight horses or, or how do you, do Possibly. you diversify anyway? Possibly. Yeah. yeah. Now, again, it'll be if, if the odds imply that that's the way to do it, then we'll do it. Absolutely. So obviously the way it works in, in really sort of basic terms is our models, our algorithms will spit out a price. So let's say a price for a horse is we sp- it gets spat out and it's $2, but the market have it at $2.50 or $3 or $4. That's a buy, obviously, because we've rated it a 50% chance or a $2 chance. The market's rating it as a 33% chance or a $3 chance. So there's an edge there. So then we'll automatically take a position on that based on that edge. This is the How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast, brought to you by 10MinuteStockTrader.com, where we cover finance, stocks, options, entrepreneurship, education, and money. And here's your host, voted one of the top 100 people in finance, Christopher Ewell. Hey there, traders. Welcome back to today's How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. Today, we have a special lesson for you. I'm putting it here on the podcast because I really believe that this is going to provide you massive, massive value. And that's what I'm trying to do here. And hey, listen, if this podcast was useful to you at all, I really highly suggest that you go check out the full trading course at AIStockTradingSystem.com. That's AIStockTradingSystem.com. Markets are people. People are predictable. Outlier can show you how to track market fear and greed with artificial intelligence on over 1,300 of the largest market cap names. Visit outlier.com to learn more. That's O-V-T-L-Y-R.com. They have a free pilot program for the rest of 2021 so you can get access to right now at O-V-T-L-Y-R.com. That's O-V-T-L-Y-R.com. Hey, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified every time we give you more tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter every single week. Hey there, traders. Welcome back to today's How to Trade Stocks Options podcast. Today, we have a special guest, Brendan Poots. He uh, he runs a website called Prioma, and Brendan has a very, very interesting, you could consider it investing philosophy. You might consider it a different type of philosophy, but I'm just really interested to learn more about Brendan and what he does. Brendan, thanks for so much for uh, coming online today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. You know, when I first heard about what you do, the term gambling hedge fund came up and I was like, how is that a thing? So <laughs> I'm very curious to learn more. And, uh, you know, t- tell me tell me about, about you, about your history and, and Priyom and how we got here today. All right. Well, it's a sort of circuitous story, circuitous path to get here, but um, by way of background, I um, an Irish background, grew up in Sydney, Australia, and whilst I, I studied chemical engineering at University of Sydney, um, and the only reason I chose chemical engineering was because I needed to have my summers off so I could play cricket. I wanted to play cricket, so the only way I could do that was to have a summer sport, was to, instead of getting a job straight out of school, was to go to university. And I picked chemical engineering because it was the best degree that I could get into with my mark. So there was no thought process behind it. Fast forward four years or five years of the engineering degree. um, I stuck at it. I got through it. And on graduation, I still remember this day, everybody was going to work for some consulting companies, McKinsey, et cetera. Some were going to work for the big chemical companies, Shell, Caltex, those guys. And I stood up. I did quite well academically and I stood up and they said, oh, Brendan's going to play cricket in England. So my first job out of university was actually playing county cricket in England. So I, I ventured off to England and played league cricket, uh, which is the feeder into the county system. And like every league cricket club, it's like AAA baseball, basically. Okay. It's the level, the level below the top stuff. And every club had a benefactor. Now, my benefactor was a bookmaker. So he was the one that provided me with the house and the car, part-time work in the bookmaking agencies, et cetera. And this was late 90s, so 20 years ago now. And what was very big back then working in the bookmaking was the sports betting angle. It wasn't very big in Australia at that time, lots of horse racing. 
obviously, in Australia, but not a lot of sports betting. And I remember watching the sport, the sports as they go along. I was watching it live in the betting shop and then someone would make a putt at golf and the odds would change. And I was obviously a gambler from way back, having Irish blood. That's basically what we do. <laughs> so I saw that and I was looking at that. And after three years of trying to play cricket, um, that sort of sowed the seed. I played my cricket. I did as best as I could, had a good time, and then said, all right, I'm never going to make it because, unfortunately, cricket at the time, it's a bit different now, but at the time it's a very shallow pool of who can make money out of playing cricket. It's You had to be at the very top. You couldn't be like in golf where you can be the 300th golfer in the world and still make good money. In cricket, you had to be the top 10 or 15 in your country to be able to make good money out of it, and I wasn't good enough. So fast forward that, I returned to Australia and um, I got a job, which I was working for a, a McKinsey offshoot at a consulting firm, management consulting, et cetera. And I was living in Perth at this time on the other side of Australia and I rented this little house straight across the road from the beach. Beautiful, beautiful at Cottesloe Beach. And I, just, I was sick of paying rent. I was paying $160 a week rent for this one-bedroom box. So I set myself a goal. Let's start paying your rent by winning on the horses or on sport. So I was 27 at the time or whatever it would have been, 26, 27 or something like that, 28. So basically I paid for my um, rent for a couple of years just by winning on the horses and at sport. And I'd be maybe having one or two bets a week to make the $160, but it meant that all of my income was to be spent on other things rather than rent. So Kano left, left Perth, moved to Melbourne, uh, sporting capital, horse racing capital of Australia, um, worked in a small venture capital type firm where I was investing in new technologies. And then partway through that, I, I was sick of it and I wanted, to, I wanted to go and live in New York always wanted to go and live in New York, but I didn't want to work in New York. So basically what I did, I, I wrote a letter to them to go to their business school. And fast forward, what I did, I, ended, I did six months of an MBA degree in Cape Town. And then I remember getting the phone call um, from a lady called Jennifer Tromba. She may or may not still be there, but she rang me up and said, Brennan, we'd like you to come to Columbia University. Would you be interested? And I was like, Oh, hang on, I'm, just, I'm watching the Australian Open tennis at the moment. I can't actually, let me call you back next week. So when I fast forward, I go to Columbia University and finish off my MBA degree at Columbia. And this was in 2007, 2008, when the whole GFC happened. All the while I'd been betting, all the while I'd been sort of modifying my strategies, my sports, using data, spreadsheets and all that. And what happened during uni Obviously, Columbia sets you up for a job or it can set you up for a job trading your typical financial securities, property securities, those types of things. But when the crash happened, everyone lost. So there was nothing that did not go down. Fine art was going down because people weren't buying their art because they lost money on the stock market. Fast cars, all of that sort of dropped. But the only thing that didn't drop was that sport was still being played. So that was the seed for me that gave me the idea of this could be the ultimate uncorrelated asset, the one that just goes on regardless of what happens. Now, coronavirus, to skip forward 10 years now, coronavirus stopped some sport, it modified some sport without crowds, but by and large, sport still happened. So that was the origins of it. And then after Columbia, I, went, I worked for a, a wealthy Miami-based entrepreneur who sent me to China, and I basically saved everything I could with a view to um, making money, trading my own money on the sport. Um, and then I got a couple of friends and family who gave me some money on the sport. They said, why don't you, well, you're doing it for yourself, do it for us as well. And then in 2011, it effectively became a sports hedge fund open to investors who I'd never heard of or I'd never met. So that's how we got to got started, got to the starting line, was basically my own money, friends, trials and errors. And then since then, we've basically, we've grown and we still trade sport and we trade it. The other, and I sort of skipped around a bit there, the other thing which sort of 
was the catalyst for the idea was the um, burgeoning in-play markets, whereas previously betting on sport used to be very much one directional, whereas you'd have a bet at the start of the match and then you'd have to sit on that until the result at the end of the match. So it was just one directional. You'd have a bet, you'd either win or lose. With the advent of Betfair, Betfair is the biggest exchange going around, but then there's other exchanges. That allows you to trade in play as a game progresses. So your side can go 1-0 up if it's a football match, and then you can take your money off the table. Your side can go 1-0 down, but then that will allow you to either go in again on your original bet at a higher price, and you can average out your price, or you can go into an alternative market which will act as a natural hedge to your original position. So the in-play markets were what, um, the fact that I was decent at it and then uh, decent at making money and being disciplined, but then the in-play markets allowed it to be a hedge, a genuine hedge fund where you can put a bet on, your team can lose 2-1, but if you were leading 2-0, you could have made a profit out of that match. So that's sort of the origin of where, how we got there. We'll that is so today. interesting. Well, first, I got to say, you are so well traveled from Australia to, you said Cape Town, was that South Africa? Correct. That? Cape Town, Cape All Town right, South so Africa. Australia, then, Cape Town, New York to Colombia to China, now back to Australia. Correct. And you can throw in Miami there as well because my, right. my boss was a Miamiite. So I used to spend, I used to spend three months a year in Miami as well. Wow. Okay. Very fun. cool. You're making me jealous on that front because I, I basically lived in Texas my whole life, but that's okay. I I um I fought myself a long while for that because obviously that sort of fluid lifestyle, you come back and you meet friends who are at the same spot and they've been working for someone for 15 years, they're much further progressed financially and all that. So yes, it was I guess I look back and if I was to pass away tonight, then I've lived a fairly full life, if not yeah. one of I wanted to get to eventually, which we're working on. Well, so so the Clooney Fund, I'm looking the right Clooney. on your website, the Prioma so, website. Is Clooney that your fund? fund? Yeah. So basically, um, the reason and Clooney just... Oh, Clooney, already, not Clooney. Sorry, my bad. No, no, it's Clooney and it's short for my father was raised in a little country town called Donna Clooney in Ireland and they shortened it to Clooney. So it's an ode to my father. So... It's a multi-sport fund. So one of the things we decided to do when we said, okay, okay, let's see if we can get outside investors interested was have a low volatility fund because the perception, and this has been one of the hardest things, is the educating of people about that betting is not necessarily volatile or binary anymore. You can actually make money out of it. So by having a multi-sport fund, that meant that, We'd be betting on, and we only bet on three sports, uh, three or four sports. There'd be golf, there'd be football, there'd be cricket, and there might be a little bit of horse racing. So if you lose on horse racing, you'll make it up on cricket. If you lose on cricket, you'll make it up on football. So it basically just reduced the volatility of the fund. So that's why we started with the multi-sport fund because of the, the overriding goal was to get investors who might write us a check for a million dollars or $2 million. And they didn't want to do that, or I'm assuming they didn't want to do that if we were up and down 20% month to month. That's a conversation I don't want to be having with any of my investors. So the Clony Fund was the starting fund because it was low volatility. Obviously, it's, it's 24-7, 365 days a year because of all the different sports involved in it. And then I'll touch on the NHL fund I spoke to you about previously later. But, yeah, so it, it trades every day or it can trade every day, every minute of every day throughout the year. So can anyone anywhere in the world invest in this? And the reason I ask is because like in the U S like gambling is super restricted. There's only certain States you can do it in. You can't do it online. And you probably know a lot more than I do about it. I just know it's not accessible everywhere. It's, but becoming, it accessible, fun? it's becoming accessible though, as you would surely know with the, with the proliferation of gambling licenses across the states. So, yeah, it's becoming much more accessible. But in short, yes, it's open to anyone. We've got US investors and the only thing you need to do from a US perspective is obviously money will go out and the IRS will find it or see it. But if the money comes back in, you just got to say it's come back in from. It's about, it's just, they they follow the money trail basically. But Mm -hmm. it's, it's legal because 
it's the Cloney Fund is registered in Australia. It's a jurisdiction where betting on sport is sort of promoted, <laughs> not just uh, accepted, it's promoted. So it's in a jurisdiction where it's allowed. So it's fine. Wow. Okay. So, you know, initially when we first had our, so to give everyone a, a little background, um, Brendan and I spoke previously, he was like, are you sure you want to have me on? I don't really invest in stocks and options and everything. And I'm like, you know, I think I do because there's a lot of correlation here and you picked it up early on and I'm picking it up as you describe you know, everything that you're doing, right? In theory, if I were to go out and buy a stock, let's say my stock happened to be named Apple and that happened to be a horse, I'm expecting Apple to pull ahead of something else and in theory, win the race versus another stock. And I spoke to another um, another guest and uh, his name's Larry Height. He's one of the original market wizards. And he really grasped the concept and, and spoke deeply on the concept of, you know, when you are trading or investing, in theory, you're gambling. You're taking a gamble saying that I expect to get a higher return in the future based on what this is today. And I see so many correlations to what you're talking about to a stock, right? You know, if, if they're all at the, the lined up gate, you've got you know, um, I don't know horse names, right? You've got, uh, what, what are some of the big horse names? Um, American Pharaoh, Barbara. Yeah, yeah exactly. Jeff you got American Apple. Pharaoh, and then right beside it, you got Apple. And then on the other side, you got Google, right? And they're all racing together. We're all trying to make more money than, than when we left the starting gate. So I totally see how this works together. That makes so much sense to me. Yeah, and obviously our time horizon is much shorter. Now, to give you an idea, we might have a, a futures bet on who will win the Stanley Cup. So that position is held for eight months, maybe six months. But obviously most games are over within two hours, three hours, four hours of its baseball perhaps. So our positions are held for a shorter period of time, but we make we take a position based on the stats, and we can talk about that later if you'd like. We take a position based on what we think will happen, and then we adjust and trade accordingly. And one of the things that also was a, a catalyst for this was, by and large, we trade only the very high-profile, highly regulated sports. So we don't do tennis, but, for instance, we wouldn't be trading the futures tennis where first prize is $3,000. We trade the ATP, the US Open tennis, et cetera, where the incentive for losing is far less than the incentive for winning. So we trade in the blue chips, if you like. I love so, that. Yeah. So that's... what we found is that mostly if you look at sport, if you follow a sport, it's pretty transparent with respect to players coming in, players coming out, uh, all the troubles in a camp, for instance, if there's people who don't like each other. We find that quite transparent in terms of the information flow, whereas if you look at companies, for instance, oftentimes – transparency is not there and all of a sudden the CEO is found guilty of something, their stock tanks. And unless you were inside that, you wouldn't know if that was going to happen. So right. we find there's so much information out there about the sport that you can actually not be surprised by something. And that's been one of the things we've tried to, we try to, that's why we only focus on a few sports because we don't want to be surprised. It's very, if you spread thin, you'll miss out on something. So our guys who do cricket, the NHL now, um, and golf, it's that's what they do. So, so nothing, that's, it, that's it. Just those three sports. Yeah, nothing will okay. nothing, nothing will surprise because of the fact that they're so in depth in those sports. What about auto racing, like Formula One? One of the the only limiting step, and it'd be interesting with your listeners. Um, the only limiting step we have, and we can bet on, we can trade on any sport, is finding an expert in that sport who can be the analyst, who can do the data, who can build the algorithms, and who can actually understand the sport. To give you a good example is previously we had a, my first recruit was a blue chip statistician data scientist from a high profile American university. And I wanted, to, I wanted to start building the golf for me. And he was looking at British, the British Open golf and he was saying to me, Brendan, I don't understand people who tee off in the morning always score better than people who tee off in the afternoon. So now if you understand the, the sport, you'll understand that weather 
plays a huge part in British Open golf. And most often the weather in the morning, it's much more calmer. There's not as much rain. It's better to play golf in the morning than it is in the afternoon. The afternoon, the wind comes in and it becomes quite problematic to score well, generally speaking. He didn't pick up on that. He didn't understand that nuance of the sport. So anyone we speak to now about any sport, they need to understand the sport. So mm. Daniel Ricciardo or um, Lewis Hamilton, mm -hmm. they have a pit stop which goes two seconds longer than it should. What does that actually mean in terms of their probability of winning? I don't know. Yeah. I go, oh, it might, it's obviously they've got to make up two seconds, but I don't know. I don't know. What track suits them better? Are they better at Monte Carlo where they get in front and it's difficult, tight turning track or are they better at Silverstone where it's long and open and can overtake? All of those things need to be understood. So the only thing, the only reason we don't bet on Formula One is because so far we haven't found someone who knows it better than the people who are going to be on the other side of the trades. Right. Because that's, that's ultimately it. We'd like to think that in the sports we trade in, we're better than 95% of the people who are on the other side of the trades. So would you consider yourself, because the more you discuss it, the more it seems like you would be considered like as a stock investor, like a fundamental investor. You want to know the inside and outside of every single detail of the company's balance sheets and financial statements and things like that versus um, like a technical trader uh, or a chart pattern trader, right? Somebody who's watching the chart, watching the price, but maybe, maybe you could feel like you're a little of both. Which, which do you think well, you identify more at, with? If I look at the algorithms that are built that underpin all of our decision-making, a lot of it's based on just your fundamental type stuff, you know, win-loss, winning on, winning on the road versus winning here. But it's also been overlaid with player ratings, how this player will match, how I'll match up against you. And then once it goes in play, then... A lot of it is based on momentum. It's also based on market movements. So if all of a sudden there's a lot of money coming in for a side that we're against, well, that will obviously ask, we'll ask questions as to why. It automatically adjusts because of that. So it's, it's sort of a combination of all. It's not because a lot of it is, it's not set and forget. It's mm -hmm. get your position, take your position, okay. And then once the game starts, you then trade that position based on new information that comes to hand. Well, this is so interesting, Brendan. I feel like I could go all day asking you a thousand questions. So, what do you do? You diversify? Like, let's say that you're doing uh, a horse race. Do you bet on three of the eight horses, or, or how do you, do you diversify in any way? Possibly, yeah. yeah. Now, again, it'll be if if the odds imply that that's the way to do it, then we'll do it. Absolutely. So. Obviously, the way it works in, in really sort of basic terms is our models, our algorithms will spit out a price. So let's say a price for a horse is, we sp it gets spat out and it's $2, but the market have it at $2.50 or $3 or $4. That's a buy, obviously, because we've rated it a 50% chance or a $2 chance. The market's rating it as a 33% chance or a $3 chance. So there's an edge there. So then we'll automatically take a position on that based on that edge. Now, if there's three or four horses in the same race that have got an edge like that, then we we play them all to different degrees of staking so that that race is, if you like, it's, it's like its own individual portfolio. So whichever, whichever horse wins will make 12% or 8% on that race. So that's how we'd approach a horse race. Wow, interesting. So... Surely not, but are you like, are you doing this all online or are you actually going to like a track and, and, you know, having to talk to somebody at a window with bars behind it and everything? No, no, this is all done. This is, if I could switch around, you'd see all right, one, two, three, four, five, plus I've got six screens in front of me, including the one I'm talking to you on. So it's all done online. Okay. So for me, and horse racing was the first passion for me in terms of um, my love of gambling, for want of a better term. So for me now, horse racing is a day out. When I go to the races to go out there, I'm not there to make money. Well, I'm there to have a flutter, have a drink, have a talk, all the things that that's a day out. Whereas mm -hmm. on a Saturday tomorrow, obviously for us here, it's a big day. We're moving into our spring carnival, which is the big Melbourne Cup pinnacle. 
So all the good horses are coming back. So I'll be desk bound. So it's not uh, glamorous. It's not glamorous in that sense. Okay. That makes sense. You know, the only time I think I went to a horse track twice and, uh, the first time I went, I was 18 and I thought at, at 18, you could gamble and apparently not. Um, cause I was up at the window, I was doing my thing. I'd, you know, make my bets. I'd come back. I'd watch it. At one point I got tapped on the shoulder. It was like, can I see your ID? <laughs> like, yeah, here. And they're like, you're not old enough. I was like, what do you mean? I'm not old enough. <laughs> I can buy cigarettes. I can go fight in a war it's, and I can't gamble. What are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. So is this limited to, obviously there, there's a chance, right? Is this limited to like a certain age group, right? Do you have to have like an over 21 investor? Do you check anything like that? I don't know. No, no, no. We do a KYC. So we do the full KYC thing where know your customer, know your client, where no, the short answer is no. Because again, in Australia, basically, if you're not gambling or having a bet on the horses by the time you're 14, you're not right. You know, that's the way... <laughs> So in Australia, everything happens at 18. Okay. And because yeah. the, fund, the fund is, um, the Cloney fund is regulated in Australia, it just means it's legal in Australia, so it's legal, full stop. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I got to tell you, this is, this is so interesting. And uh, I mean, it, it makes so much sense to me. And, and I, I honestly am surprised that there's not more availability of this right it, it doesn't well, seem this is the first time i've come across like a gambling fund but i totally get right. it well there's a big and you know, like senate bill could be 443 or something maybe there's a that allowed entity betting there's a there's a law passed and i was involved in the crafting of the legislation for that in las vegas about five or six four or five years ago which allowed Previously, if you're in Las, Ve Las Vegas and you had a buddy in New York, you couldn't take a phone call and have a bet for them because that's wire fraud and all those things. But there's now entity betting is allowed in the United States where you can actually be an entity such as ourselves and bet on behalf of other people. So that has just started, and that's because, again, there's this growing momentum with the ubiquitous movement of, of, of betting and gambling across America now. It's used to be a few states. I think it's now 10 or 15 states, but it's growing very fast. In England and Europe, there's some very big syndicates who, like we're tiny, but they're, they're mostly private syndicates, but they're big. They're billion-dollar syndicates managing, having million-dollar bets regularly, two million, five million-dollar bets on big events. But they tend to be very private, so you don't actually know. They don't call for out, outside investors, whereas... Where obviously I'm not born of the silver spoon or born of great wealth, so I've had to sort of do the graft myself. And the way the business can grow is not by tapping my father on the shoulder or tapping my trust fund, but going out and talking to new clients and hopefully managing some of their their net worth. So, how would somebody invest with you? Is this something where, like, um, I've had other managers on the podcast and they're like, oh yeah, it's ticker symbol XYZ. You just go out and buy XYZ and you're investing with me. How does how would someone invest with you? So basically it's your typical fund where someone gives us a hundred thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars and that just goes into our pool of total funds and then every bet we strike, they'll be taking a proportion of that bet effectively. So um, and then you're looking at your typical monthly reports every month and then you, you get your monthly statements and you just track it like a normal superannuation or what do you guys call it? Your retirement fund type thing. Oh, like an IRA, something, uh, yeah, 401k. Something like yeah. 401k. So it just goes into a pool and at the end of every month, you get a statement saying you either made money or lost money that month. Okay. So they'd actually have to like reach out to someone at the Prioma group and have a conversation with them. Correct. And okay. then you get the paperwork. It's all the same. So it's literally just like any other fund in gotcha. that sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got to tell you, Brendan, this was really, really interesting. I'm so glad we had this conversation because I this has opened up a, a totally new and foreign world to me that uh, I didn't know existed, but I get it. It makes total sense. Yeah. So basically what I've tried to do here is having had the financial and quant background of engineering and business degree is follow the exact same principles that any hedge fund would have where we've got our data and analysis side in one part of the business and then we've got the trading and execution on the other side of the business. And then 
basically, I'm never going to be the sharpest guy in the room if I was walking down Wall Street because there's guys there who love reading annual reports and who love driving spreadsheets and who love that day in, day out. Put a sport in front of me and I love all of that. So I can put that intuition and that understanding of sport, overlay that with the mathematics and the, the market movements behind it, and then when I get fed in the algorithms by my data scientists, it sort of gives us a – I can't – I feel like I'm one of the – we're one of the – smarter betters yeah and that's a good that's a good spot to and be you're doing because- something with it too because there's so many people here at least where i live um that they you know they they love their sports they love their college football they love their uh nfl and college basketball and things like that and they will talk about it all day and all night and they you know listen to the radio on it all day and all night and i'm like you're wasting your life like LeBron James doesn't give any cares about you whatsoever. Why do you care so much about LeBron James? And on the other end of it, you're actually doing something about it. And I think well, that's pretty cool too. They're the passionate people we need to be putting their $10 bets. Because okay, all of those, that makes sense. All of those $10 bets on their favorite team add up to a big pool of money and their favorite team might be no good. And we mm-hmm. might be on the other side of that $10 bet. Yeah. So that's the thing. That's like we've taken, again, with these screens that I've got here and we take a very unsexy approach. When we're watching sport, if we're involved in it, we're looking at numbers. We're not looking at the joy of the sport, if you like. Yeah. So we approach it in a very different way. But that's why it's great to go to the races or go to a match where I've got no financial interest. I can just enjoy the sport like any other fan. Mm-hmm. But I'd never bet on that. Well, I'd never bet on those matches with money that is not pocket money. Right. Because it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. But that's the thing. Those passions, the passion is one of the things we, we, we need. We want people to be betting on the Yankees no matter who they're playing. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Because, you know, you're a Yankee fan, you're never going to back Boston. Even if Boston right. is much better than them, you're never going to back them. And that's, and that's the way bookmakers make money as well. So, you know, bookmakers make money by beating someone. We're, we're the same. We're the same. Gotcha. Well, Brendan, this has been such an educational chat. And I, I really appreciate you taking your time to, uh, to go over all this with us today. And, um, you know, before we go, I want to make sure we send everyone over to prioma.com. That's P-R-I-O-M-H-A.com. Uh, to learn more about Brendan, what he does and what his fund does. And, you know, Brendan, what, what kind of parting words of wisdom would you have for us today? Well, for, for anyone who wants to do it, it's not like that's one of the things we always get is um, it's the dream job or whatever, but you can't do it without the discipline and you can't do it without the money management. And that's one of the good things you need. You need that. So you need those fundamental money management principles to do it but it is a if you enjoy sport it's a it's a great way of blending the two together yeah it really is sounds just like stocks (laughs) it it totally is and i guess the other thing is it's it's no longer binary it's no as i mentioned to you if you do it smartly and if you take advantage of the in play type opportunities it's no longer a binary you don't put $100 on and lose $100. So give you mm. a quick example. If we put $100 on and it's going the wrong way, we'll exit our trade and we might lose $30. So we lose $30 on our 100 as opposed to previously where you'd lose your $100 on your 100. That, that's exactly the way that stock traders can survive, is that their winning bets are bigger than their losing bets. And they, right. even, they could even have a win rate of 25%. But as long as that win, win dollar amount is bigger than the right. last dollar amount, yeah. Right, because you, you ride your winners, ride them mm-hmm. home, but you just got to, and that's the thing. And one of the things that you see a lot, because I get a lot of people who want to apply for a job and they talk to me, oh, he'll, he'll score now. They, 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 they'll score, they'll score. And it's that emotion of holding on to a losing position. Oh, yeah. Besides one nil down, no, no, they'll come back, they'll come back. And we say, no, no, the trade's going the wrong way. Let's just get out of it and then move on to the next one. Dust our $30 off the $100, mm-hmm. keep 70 and then we'll just ride the winner next tomorrow or the next day. And that's that's the hardest thing. It's just taking out that pure emotion of they'll come back. They're my favorite team. They always score. Not always. Sounds exactly like stock trading. That's so interesting. Yeah. It, <laughs> well, it, it is. Yeah, except yeah. I, it's, a lot more, it's a lot more fun 
doing the research. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you probably have a lot more fun watching it than just bars on a screen. So, <laughs> of course, yeah, no, it's, it's good. Well, Brendan, this has been absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Perfect. Thank you. And Cheers, thank Chris. you guys for tuning in to today's How to Trade Stocks Options podcast. Make sure you like, subscribe, and enable notifications. That way you never miss any of the tools, tips, and tricks that we upload every single week to help you trade faster and trade smarter. I'll see you on the next episode. Okay, so what'd you think? That was pretty incredible, right? Now, if you like that, that's only a taste, only a sample of what you're gonna find in the full AI stock trading system. And I really highly encourage you to go and check this out. Obviously, you are interested in learning and how to trade, and that's why you're listening to this podcast. Now, I'm going to take and download my entire trading system that I use day in and day out onto you. <laughs> and the only way I'm gonna be able to do that is over at the AIStockTradingSystem.com. You're gonna get phase one, two, and three, several bonuses. And on top of that, I'm going to walk you through over a dozen trades that I put on inside of my account, holding your hand and showing you exactly how I got in, how I got out, how I use the artificial intelligence data, and how this could work inside of your own trading portfolio on a daily basis. So make sure you head on over to AIStockTradingSystem.com. That's AIStockTradingSystem.com to learn more and to get started and to download my decade plus worth of trading experience into your hands so you can start using the AI Stock Trading System today, the five-step system to take the guesswork out of trading. Hey, if you like this video, let me know by leaving me a like below and then subscribe and share it with somebody you think could use it as well. Be sure to comment below with your biggest takeaway from this episode and any suggestions you have for future episodes. And finally, make sure you watch these other videos to help you trade faster and trade smarter, and I'll see you on the next episode.